So what did we do? We had three groups. The first group, so we took those 122 people and we assigned them to one of three groups. The first group was a kindness group. What these folks did was over the course of five weeks, they were asked to two days a week engage in three acts of kindness per day. So they had these kindness clusters, right? So in a given week, they would pick any two days they wanted to pick and we asked them to do at least three acts of kindness on those days. They did things like I've, I've said today, they held the door open for people, they said hello to people they didn't know, they um, volunteered at various places, they paid for people's coffee at Starbucks or wherever they happened to be, they uh, did things for their roommates, it wasn't all strangers, they did things for their roommates, they maybe cooked dinner, they cleaned up, um, they cleaned up the apartment. One of my favorites is that they shoveled snow for other people. I was like, where were these little kindness angels when I was <laughs> um, needing someone to come shovel my driveway? So they did those kinds of things. Three acts of kindness each day, two days a week for five weeks. That's the length of the study. This other group, are, are um, we assign people to what we call the social activities group. And in this group, we ask people to two days a week, we didn't put a time limit or how many social activities, but two days a week to do something planned and intentional with um, other people in some way that should be fun for you. So that could be having a game night, having dinner, going for a walk with people, whatever might be fun for the individual participant. But twice a week for these five weeks, engage in some sort of like social activity with other people. The reason we did this group is because we thought maybe kindness is helping people because it's connecting them to other people. And so maybe it's not something special about kindness, maybe it's just something about being around other people. So when you're being kind to people, you're engaging with people. So that's what this group was for. And then the last group, you can't see this that well, but this is our thought record group. And when you go um, to get treatment for depression and sometimes anxiety from a cognitive behavioral therapist, what they have you do often is these thought records. And this is basically to challenge the thoughts that you have that are related to your experience of depression. So if I have the thought, nobody likes me, then I'm gonna perhaps do a thought record, like where was I, what was happening when I had that thought, um, what, you know, kind of when did I think that, how did I feel when I thought that, get all that kind of information down on the thought record, and then start walking through, like, what's the evidence for that? What's the evidence that no one likes me? Is there anyone I can think of that likes me? Has there been a time in my life where people liked me? And I'm gonna write down that evidence and kind of come up with a balanced thought in the end. So, like, maybe right now I'm kind of, like, new to Columbus or I'm lonely and so I don't feel like I'm very connected to lots of people and also I have people in my life over the course of my life who've liked me so it's probably not true that nobody likes me and then I come up with this balanced replacement thought. So people did, and people did those twice a week although we didn't limit it if they wanted to do them all day every day that was also fine and um, so they either did the kindness activities, the social activities or the thought records. And then they turned those in to us so we could kind of see what it was they were doing in each of those conditions when we asked them to do it. Does that all make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. So what did we think would happen, our hypotheses before we started? We thought that um, we see decreased symptoms of depression and anxiety. We thought that we would see this in all three groups. The thought records and the social activities are things that you would do in treatment for depression and anxiety, so we expected them to result in decreased symptoms of anxiety and depression, and we also expected the acts of kindness to result in decreases in anxiety and depression. We thought we'd see increased positive emotions. We thought we might only see this in the acts of kindness group. So the other kinds of the thought records, that often doesn't make you feel great when you're doing it. It makes you feel better, but kind of like back up to your baseline. Sometimes it doesn't have a lot of like positive emotions associated with it. So we thought we might see the biggest increase in positive emotions in the kindness group. Increased satisfaction with life, again, we expect to see that in all three groups. And then the increased social connection, we thought we would see that mostly in the acts of kindness and the social activities group. So these are the outcomes we were looking for. We're thinking, can we impact people's experiences in these ways? So here's what we found. The good news is participants in all three groups reported reductions in their symptoms of depression and anxiety over time. So the study was five weeks, 
and then we followed them another five weeks. We had a full 10 weeks. So in all three groups, we, sound, we found that there's a reduction in symptoms of anxiety and depression and stress in that first five weeks, and that those kind of stayed down over the following five weeks. So that's good news. Um, we also found that all three groups, there was decrease in negative emotion and then increase in satisfaction with life. So no matter what group you got, you felt better at the end of the group. Your life satisfaction went up, your negative, af your negative emotions went down, your symptoms of depression and anxiety went down. The positive emotions didn't go up in any of the groups. So that whatever we were doing was not hitting on those kind of positive emotions, which was surprising to us. We'll have to circle back to that. Only the acts of kindness group showed an increase in social connection. This is surprising um, and cool, I think. Uh, so the people who were doing kind things for other people reported that they felt more connected socially to their social networks, but also to kind of like the community at large. And we'll come back to this too. And then all of these changes were maintained at five week follow up. So that's the full 10 weeks. Now the between groups, so that's across groups. Then we think about like, okay, well, how did these, how did these groups compare to each other? The acts of kindness participants were better than the thought record participants. We call that cognitive reappraisal, but they did better than the thought record participants in the reductions of depression and anxiety. This is, I think, um, probably the splashiest part of these findings. This was unexpected, and we'll want to replicate this and do this again. Um, but we found that although people got better in all three groups, people got more better in the acts of kindness group than they did in the thought record group in terms of their depression and anxiety. Again, surprising because that is how we treat depression and anxiety, although there's lots of differences about how we did it and how you would do this if you were seeing a therapist. Um, and also the acts of kindness group had more, in, a bigger increase in their satisfaction with life compared to the thought record group. The acts of kindness participants did better than the social activities participants in terms of this increase in social connection. Which again, so comparing the acts of kindness to both these other groups and the things we would expect those other groups to be best at, the acts of kindness group participants uh, did a little bit better. So one thing we wanted to look at a little bit more is what's going on with the social connection piece and the acts of kindness group. And what we found was there's something called public self-absorption. And what this is, it sounds, um, I think it sounds worse than it actually is. Uh, and some of the press coverage has called it narcissism, which it is not. But public self-absorption is the kind of the degree to which you think about what other people think about you while you're interacting with them, if that makes sense to you. So if I'm talking to you and you're telling me a story about what happened to you that day and if I'm high on public self-absorption, I might the whole time you're talking be thinking about what am I going to say next when they're done talking or like how am I going to, what are they thinking about me? Does my face look weird while they're explaining the story to me? Like what's happening here? And so I'm thinking about what you're thinking about me while you're talking. That's public absorption. And what we found was that only in the acts of kindness group, people in the acts of kindness group, the more, when they engage in acts of kindness, they felt less public self-absorption. So they thought less about what other people were thinking about them. And then to the degree that they felt less public self-absorption, they, that explained the relationship between doing acts of kindness and reduced symptoms of depression and anxiety, increased satisfaction with life, and increased social connection. So just to break this down, you got in one of these three conditions, if you were in the acts of kindness that predicted you having less self-absorption to the degree you had less self-absorption that predicted your improvement in symptoms. Does that make sense? So we think when we go back here and look at acts of kindness, participants in acts of kindness having bigger improvements than people in the thought record group or the social activities group, the best explanation we have for that is because they experience this reduction in public self-absorption. Does that make sense? I want to talk about, before we go into this piece, some of the limitations of this. So one of the things, um, you know, you can never control like how people talk about 
research that you've done. And one of the things that people have said is like, kindness works better than um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I'm like, oh, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, that's really not what we measured, right? So people came into the study and they were assigned to one of the three groups. We met with them one time for 30 to 45 minutes to explain here's how you do acts of kindness, here's how you do it if you were in that group, if you are in this group, here's how you do a thought record, and if you're in this group, here's what we want you to do with social activities. But we can all probably appreciate that it's much harder to do a thought record if you haven't done a thought record before than it is to do acts of kindness. It's also harder to do a thought record than it is to like have dinner with people that you know, to engage in social activities. So one of the things we're looking at with these data now is do we see some of these differences because it's much easier to pick up doing acts of kindness and social activities than it is to do a thought record, right? You would never have a therapist that said like, hey, nice to meet you. I've listened to your problems for 30 minutes. Here's some thought records, like good luck with that. So we're comparing it to a technique that is likely to be used in therapy, but I just wanna be clear, whenever I talk about this, I wanna be clear, I'm not saying to people, I don't think people should get therapy if they're depressed or anxious. I think that uh, that's a good thing to do. Um, so why does this matter? Uh, why do we you know, care that we did this? One of the things I take from this day, there's a famous positive psychologist named Chris Peterson. Um, he's passed away, but he used to always say people matter. And if there's one thing we know from looking at this kind of psychology, we know that how people are interacting with other people really has a lot to do with how they're feeling and how they're doing and what kinds of things, uh, their mood and their symptoms and things like that. And here we found that there's something particular about kindness that led people, resulted in people feeling more connected to other people. And so if we could do something small, these are small things that people were doing two days a week. If we could do something small and have that increase how connected we feel to our communities and the people around us and the people that we're working with and living with, then that could be a really powerful thing, right? People matter. And if this helps us like, be more connected to those people, then that could be important. The other thing is that I think to me, one of the most interesting and compelling pieces of this is the acts of kindness is related to reductions in thinking about how other people are thinking about you. And I think about particularly coming out of the pandemic, right? We got to this place where we were kind of isolated and in our homes and maybe away from people and we didn't get used to being around people in the same way anymore. And so a lot of us, I think, got um, a little bit uh, disconnected from kind of the normal, or not normal, but routine interactions we were having day to day. So if we can, if when I'm doing something nice, I'm not thinking about myself, I'm thinking about how can I do something nice for this other person? How can I do something kind for this other person? And that disrupts some of the self-focus that is really problematic for me slash us uh, in this scenario. So. Thinking about yourself when you're engaged with other people almost never leads to kind of good things. So if this disrupts that, that could be really useful. The other thing that uh, heartens me about this line of research is that currently our mental health care system is a mess. It's very hard for people to get treatment, right? So just a plug for the Ohio State Psychological Services Center, we offer free treatment to people in the community. So if uh, folks are in need of treatment, you should uh, look up Ohio State Psychological Services Center. But, you know, it's hard to get affordable mental health care. It's hard to get into see a therapist, a competent therapist, someone who treats the thing that you are showing up with, doesn't have a super long wait list, isn't really expensive. Those things are all difficult. So for me, these data suggest that three, all three of these things, three really low cost, self-directed interventions. These are all things that people did on their own. Like I said, they had a 30-minute meeting with us at the beginning, but after that it was self-directed that these interventions all resulted in reductions of symptoms of depression and anxiety. So there's some ways in which the acts of kindness group um, was superior to or did better than uh, the other two conditions, but all three of them, if you go back to the very first finding, all three of them uh, resulted in reductions in depression, anxiety, and stress symptoms. So to me, that's great. That means that we have things that we could tell people, like, try this. While you're on the wait list or while you're doing these other kinds of things, you could try any of these three things that can kind of fit with you. 
And then kindness specifically had, was pretty powerful for increases in life satisfaction. So if what you're thinking about is, I want to reduce my symptoms of stress and depression and anxiety, but I also want to increase how like vital I feel, how zestful I feel, increase my life satisfaction, then kindness was particularly powerful for that and particularly powerful in terms of social connection. So we can kind of like lead people towards those things. So that was shorter than I meant to be, so I also have this extra slide I want to show you. This is, I like to call this kindness for the lazy. Um, and so, you know, if I, when I think about people often ask me when we talk about this study, like what kinds of things do people do? And this I did many years before we did this study. On my 40th birthday, uh, I know I look very young, but it was a long time ago. So on my 40th birthday, I sent this email to uh, about 35 people and basically said, my birthday is coming up. What I would really like for my birthday is for you to engage in some sort of random act of kindness or do something, um, some sort of charitable act and just save it up and then on my birthday, email me what you did so that all day long on my birthday, I can, the 35 of you can send me these things. Um, and I said, you know, pass it on to other people if you want to, your spouses, your kids. I would love to get 40 acts of kindness for my 40th birthday. So I sent this around. And then what I got was close to 130 things on my birthday that came in that day. So you can see some of the things people did, like I picked up dog poop from the neighborhood park, right? Acts of kindness don't have to have like a specific person that you're thinking about there. I like the young ones, right? So here's an eight-year-old. I stood up for someone who was being picked on. Um, I gave chef's jackets to the line cooks at a local restaurant. I bought bags of groceries and took it to the homeless shelter. I smiled and said hi to at least five people a day for two weeks. Right, so you could take a look at these. People donated money, people did things that took their time. Um, people did things for people they knew. I babysat for a single mom and they did things for people they didn't know. Um, someone made a quilt of valor for wounded service people. Someone taught a young girl how to ride her bike. Um, and then here's the second page. There's a third page, but I didn't want to overwhelm you all with all of the nice things that all these people did. But, you know, I donated from my piggy banks to abused children ages two and five. I cleared the driveway for a neighbor of snow while they were gone. Mowed a neighbor's lawn. Um, I like this one. Made 1,782 sandwiches for bread basket with the fourth grade classes. And then they also sent pictures. So here's the sandwich makers. These are the fourth graders you know, made cookies for people, sent some of my old stuffed animals to a children's hospital, uh, gently used stuffed animals to a children's hospital. These girls made, uh, had a lemonade stand and donated all of their earnings from their lemonade stand to an animal shelter. This young uh, boy was tutoring other people in his class that were having a hard time. So you start at any age and it can be anything, right? There's just like no end to what people can do to engage in these acts of kindness. So if you want to engage in kindness, but you don't want to actually do all of it, you could do something like this. Yeah. And that is what I have for you. Questions, discussion? Yes. The question was, is it being taped? Because yeah. she knows some people that could really benefit from it. It is being taped, and I think will be posted on the library's YouTube channel. Yeah. Other questions, thoughts, ways we can make the next study better? Yes. So what, what is the next study, or what are you thinking about Go, yeah, where are you thinking about yeah. going from here? Yeah, well, one of the things we're doing now is we're going back through the homework worksheets that people did to see what people actually did, and we're trying to understand um, if the thought records, if people were able to do them on their own, right? So we do see, I mean, they were able to do something, but to see kind of like how high quality they were and see if that moderates or that impacts how strong that, that, uh, that intervention was. But what we want to do going forward is really think about can you do this in a broader way, in a less kind of controlled experimental way? Like if you teach this in classes or in libraries or in communities, you know, do you get the same kind of effect if it's not so one-on-one -on -one in the beginning? So can we disseminate it a little bit better that way? Yeah, yeah, yes. 
your study was five weeks long. Was there any follow-up to see were people continuing to do these things after that, maybe six months later asking, or some time after asking, have you maintained this on your own? Yeah. Um, or was this, I have to, I have this five-week study done, check, yeah. and that's it? Kind of in between those two options, right? So we, <laughs> it was a five-week study. We followed them for another five weeks. So we have 10 weeks of data on people. Um, that would be another thing that we could do in the future if there's any funders out there who want to pay for us to have longer follow-up times uh, to see how long this lasts. So we had them do five weeks where we asked them specifically to do these things and turn in homework, and then we followed them for another five weeks. The vast majority of the people in the Acts of Kindness group said they continued to engage in Acts of Kindness after the five weeks. So um, that's another thing we'd like to look at is, you know, do one of these conditions, is it, have, is it stickier than other conditions? Are, are, are people more likely to keep doing those things? There is data that if you ask people to do acts of kindness like every day, that they stop doing it. That they feel really good, they do it for two or three weeks, they feel really good, and then they stop doing it. It, feels, it starts to feel like a chore a little bit, which is why we had people bunch it up on two days. So it's still six things, it's still basically equivalent to one thing a day, but hopefully it's a little stickier when it feels a little more novel. Yes. You wait for the mic. Yeah. <laughs> I just came here halfway through, so I was really thinking, just listening to you, um, when people did the acts of kindness, wasn't it like to them that they might have already been doing this, like it was kind of a mindful thing? And, um, and, and now, I mean, because sometimes it's with our manners, right? The way we Absolutely. were raised. Absolutely. And so did they like surprise themselves to find out that I was kind of doing this or maybe I'm doing it more and not have to be asked? Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, you know, it's an interesting thing that you say with manners because I was raised, a lot of these things are just like how you, that's just how you act, right? You just act right. And so when I started talking about this with my class, my undergrad class, and I said, what kinds of things might people do that are acts of kindness? They would say things like, hold the door open for people. And I was like, what? That's not, acts of kind that's not an act of kindness. You just have to do that. Like, that's just what you do. So I think people have a range of things that they are already doing. And most of the people, if they were already doing those kinds of things, I do th think it brought some mindfulness to it. But I think they probably did things above and beyond what they were already doing. So if you're doing something and you don't really think that it is an act of kindness, then you would probably, I don't know this for sure, we would have to look at this in a study, but you, most people did something above and beyond what they were already doing to kind of like really try to do the thing that we were asking them to do. So it's probably why you get some people who are holding the door, they weren't doing that before, and you get other people who are, you know, shoveling snow, which is something that they weren't doing before. I know I'm obsessed with the shoveling snow example because I just was so jealous. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts? It's really an act of kindness for you all to be here today. This is, I, I mean, it is. I, I am a, sometimes a nervous public speaker, so it's really nice to have people engaged and here and sitting in front of me and not just uh, thinking about a camera. So I appreciate you all being, I appreciate you all being here.